Thank you for listening to Radio Maria, a Christian voice in your home. We are now continuing with Jesus, the promised Messiah of Judaism with Roy Shulman. Hi, this is Roy Shulman and welcome again to Jesus, the promised Messiah of Judaism, the show on Radio Maria that celebrates the Jewish roots of the Catholic Church or seen the other way around that celebrates the completion, the fulfillment, the full realization of all of the promise of Judaism in the Catholic Church and her sacraments. Well, it's a good day to be uh, celebrating <laughs> the transformation of Judaism into the Catholic Church because we're coming up on the birthday of the Catholic Church. That is, tomorrow is Pentecost, uh, when the Holy Spirit descended, and um, it is uh, understood to be the birthday of the Church, the day the Church was born, when the Holy Spirit descended on the Apostles through the Blessed Virgin Mary and um, gave birth to the new transformed version of Judaism, which we know of as the Catholic Church. Now, I don't want to scandalize anybody. I said that a bit tongue in cheek when I said version of Judaism because, because um, uh, boy, I don't want to get in trouble for saying that. The Catholic Church, the Judaism was the promise of the Catholic Church to come, I guess is the best way to put it. And then the Catholic Church came, and it came on Pentecost. So I can't ignore that. Uh, there are two wonderful reasons for celebrating this uh, weekend, this Pentecost weekend, so to speak. And um, one is that it's the birthday of the Church, and therefore, in some sense, the day of the transformation from Judaism into the Catholic Church, although there are other days like... like uh, Good Friday, that one could also consider the uh, day of transformation. And the other reason is that if we've ever seen a picture uh, that has uh, that shows the descent of the Holy Spirit on Pentecost, every picture that I've ever seen shows the Holy Spirit descending through the Blessed Virgin Mary to the Apostles. The Holy Spirit descending into uh, the Blessed Virgin Mary and then kind of distributing out from her to the apostles. That may not actually be every picture, but it's one of the common themes of the pictures. And virtually every picture has the Blessed Virgin Mary at the center of the apostles at the time that the Holy Spirit descends on them. So the second part of the show, I will talk about how true that is and how the Holy Spirit flows into the church through the Blessed Virgin Mary. So that's my plan for today. And as always, this is a um, live call-in program, and I'm happy to receive your calls. The number here is 866-333-6279 or 866-333-MARY, M-A-R-Y. And I'll keep an eye on the call board, and if anyone wishes to call in with a, with a uh, question or a comment, I'd be happy to take it. But I, uh, until that happens, or unless that happens, I will begin by reading uh, an eyewitness account of the first Pentecost. I say that tongue-in-cheek. It's not really an eyewitness account because it's private revelation, but it's from the revelations of, of uh, Blessed Anne Catherine Emmerich, who was a very holy, obviously, blessed, in other words, um, beatified, a visionary nun of the 19th century, and she had visions spanning most of uh, Jesus's life and much of the life of the church. And she had visions that that purported to be a vision of actually the first Pentecost. So I'm going to be reading from the account of the first Pentecost according to Anne Catherine Emmerich. Um, it appears in a, a four-volume Life of Christ um, that's still in print. That's that's published by Tan Books, and it's uh, it's rather lengthy, but it's very very beautiful. Um, either visions, if you take if you think they're legitimate visions, it's private revelation, so it's um, you know up to the individual to decide whether or not to buy into them or not but they're either beautiful meditations or beautiful visions of many scenes from the life of Christ. And that's what I will be reading from now. So here goes. The Holy Day of Pentecost. 
The whole interior of the Last Supper room was, on the eve of the feast, ornamented with green bushes in whose branches were placed vases of flowers. Peter, in his Episcopal robe, stood at a table covered with red and white under the lamp in front of the curtained Holy of Holies. On the table lay rolls of writing. Opposite him in the doorway leading from the entrance hall stood the Blessed Virgin, her face veiled, and behind her in the entrance hall stood the holy women. The apostles stood in two rows, turned toward Peter, along either side of the hall, and from the side halls the disciples ranged behind the apostles took part in the hymns and prayers. When Peter broke and distributed the bread that he had previously blessed, first to the Blessed Virgin, then to the apostles and disciples who stepped forward to receive it, they kissed his hand, the Blessed Virgin included. Besides the holy women, there were in the house of the Last Supper and its dependencies 120 of Jesus' followers. Now, let me just comment on this. This scene takes place um, in the upper room. That is where the Holy Spirit descended on the apostles at Pentecost, was in the upper room. What else took place in the upper room? What also took place in the upper room, of course, was the Last Supper itself which means uh, it's where the first Catholic Mass took place, and it's where the um, Apostles and the Blessed Virgin Mary would gather for prayer following the crucifixion of Jesus. And it's, of course, where Jesus appeared to the Apostles, both when he appeared the, uh, the, the first time, and Thomas wasn't there, and then a week later, on the following Sunday, when Thomas was there. So this upper room was the you could say was the heart of the church. It was the first it was the first place of the Catholic Church you could say, and it's exactly there where the apostles and the Blessed Virgin Mary were gathered on that first Pentecost for the descent of the Holy Spirit. Now, um, I will also point out many of you are aware of this I think that the um, reason why there were so many Jews gathered in Jerusalem on that first Pentecost, well, maybe I'm getting out of sequence, so I'll go into that more later. But remember that Pentecost, it means 50, it's the 50th day after Easter, and Judaism has the same feast of Pentecost that takes place on the 50th day after Passover. It's in fact almost has the same name because it's named sevens because it's se seven weeks after Passover. The Jewish feast of Pentecost celebrates the giving uh, of the Torah to Moses on Mount Sinai. In the Gospels and in the letters, there is reference to the fact that Moses gave you the law or God gave through Moses, God gave you the law written on tablets of stone, right? That was the Old Testament, and that was, in particular, the Ten Commandments, which were written on tablets of stone. But the day is coming when you will receive the law written on your hearts, and that is, of course, the descent of the Holy Spirit. So you already see this beautiful symmetry between the Jewish Feast of Pentecost on the 50th day after Passover, which celebrates the giving of the law to Moses on tablets of stone, and the Catholic Pentecost on the 50th day after Easter that celebrates the giving of the law written on now the human hearts of Christians by the Holy Spirit. So you already see that, that, that beautiful reflection of the, the, the symmetry between Judaism and the Catholic Church. Um, the, uh, back to the account of Anne Catherine Emmerich. After midnight there arose a wonderful movement in all nature. It communicated itself to all present as they stood in deep recollection, their arms crossed on their breast, near the pillars of the supper room and in the side hall, silently praying. Stillness pervaded the house, and silence reigned throughout the whole enclosure. 
Toward morning I saw above the Mount of Olives a glittering white cloud of light coming down from heaven and drawing near to the house. In the distance it appeared to me like a round ball borne along on a soft warm breeze. But coming nearer, it looked larger and floated over the city like a luminous mass of fog until it stood above Zion and the house of the Last Supper. It seemed to contract and to shine with a constantly increasing brightness, until at last, with a rushing, roaring noise as of wind, it sank like a thundercloud floating low in the atmosphere. I saw many Jews who saw the cloud hurrying in terror to the temple. I myself experienced a childlike anxiety as to where I should hide if the stroke were to follow, for the whole thing was like a storm that has suddenly gathered, that instead of rising from the earth came down from heaven, that was light instead of dark, that instead of thundering came down with a rushing wind. I felt that rushing motion. It was like a warm breeze full of power to refresh and invigorate. The luminous cloud descended low over the house, and with the increasing sound the light became brighter. I saw the house and its surroundings more clearly while the apostles, the disciples, and the women became more and more silent, more deeply recollected. Afterward there shot from the rushing cloud streams of white light down upon the house and its surroundings. The streams intersected one another in sevenfold rays, and below each intersection resolved into fine threads of light and fiery drops. The point at which the seven streams intersected was surrounded by a rainbow light, in which floated a luminous figure with outstretched wings, or rays of light that looked like wings, attached to the shoulders. In that same instant the whole house and its surroundings were penetrated through and through with light. The five-branched lamp no longer shone. The assembled faithful were ravished in ecstasy. Each involuntarily threw back his head and raised his eyes eagerly on high, while into the mouth of every one there flowed a stream of light like a burning tongue of fire. It looked as though they were breathing, as if they were drinking in the fire, eagerly, and as if their ardent desire flamed forth in their mouth to meet the entering flame. The sacred fire was poured also upon the disciples and the women present in the antechamber, and thus the resplendent cloud gradually dissolved as if in a rain of light. The flames descended on each in different colors and in different degrees of intensity. After that effusion of heavenly light, a joyous courage pervaded the assembly. All were full of emotion, as though intoxicated with joy and confidence. They gathered around the Blessed Virgin, who was, I saw, the only one perfectly calm, the only one that retained a quiet, holy self-possession. The apostles embraced one another, and urged by joyous confidence, exclaimed, What were we, and what are we now? The holy women also embraced. The disciples in the side halls were similarly affected, and the apostles hastened out to them. A new life full of joy, of confidence, and of courage had been infused into all. Their joy found vent in thanksgiving. They ranged for prayer, gave thanks, and praised God with great emotion. The light, meanwhile, vanished. Peter delivered an instruction to the disciples and sent several of them out to the inns of the Pentecost guests. Um, I'm interrupting here. The Pentecost guests, of course, are not referring to the Catholic Pentecost. They're referring to the Jews who had gathered in Jerusalem for the Feast of Shavuos, for the Feast of the Jewish Pentecost. Back to Anne Catherine Emmerich. Between the House of the Last Supper and the Pool of Bethesda, there were several sheds and public lodging houses for the accommodation of guests come up for the feast. Again, the Feast of Shavuos, the Jewish Feast of Pentecost, which was both a um, harvest feast celebrating the fall harvest and, more significantly, was the anniversary of the giving of the law to Moses on Mount Sinai. They were at this time very numerous, and they too received the grace of the Holy Ghost. An extraordinary movement pervaded all nature. 
Good people were roused interiorly, while the wicked became timid, uneasy, and still more stiff-necked. The good ones became, by all that they had seen and heard, quite in intimate and kindly disposed towards the disciples, so that the latter, intoxicated with joy, announced to them the promise of the Holy Ghost as having been fulfilled. Then, too, did they become conscious of a change within their own souls, and at the summons of the disciples, they gathered around the pool of Bethsaida. In the house of the Last Supper, Peter imposed hands on five of the apostles who were to help teach and baptize at the pool of Bethsaida. They were James the Last, Bartholomew, Matthias, Thomas, and Jude Thaddeus. This last name had a vision during his ordination. It seemed to him that he was clasping to his breast the body of the Lord. Before departing for the pool of Bethsaida to consecrate the water and administer baptism, they received on their knees the benediction of the Virgin Mary. Okay, so the Holy Spirit having descended, the uh, Jews from all over the world having been gathered in Jerusalem for the Jewish Feast of Pentecost, that is the Feast of Shavuos, the Holy Spirit descended and 3,000 of those Jews and um, followers of Judaism who were gathered in Jerusalem flooded, if you excuse the pun, to be baptized. And they were going to the pool of Bethsaida um, to be baptized. That pool was um, very near the temple. It was, if I'm not mistaken, where the um, animals for the temple sacrifice were were cleansed before they went to the temple to be offered for sacrifice. I could be wrong about that. It's also, of course, where the uh, Jesus healed the paralytic who had been lying by that pool for decades waiting for an opportunity to go in the water when the uh, Holy Spirit stirred the waters of the pool because at that time um, anyone, the first person who entered the water would be healed. So that pool of Bethsaida occurs, uh, appears in, in multiple times in the Gospels. And it's there that the uh, Jews who flooded into the church on the first Pentecost went to be baptized. So back to the account of Anne Catherine Emmerich. Um, also, by the way, notice, um, I, I think that throughout this account of the first Pentecost, you see the centrality of the Blessed Virgin Mary um, in, in the church, not just in the early church, but in the church as a um, sacred divine institution, because of course, the disciples and apostles were gathered around her when the Holy Spirit descended. The Holy Spirit descended, uh, I believe, through her. And when the apostles went to baptize those 3,000 who were the first, the first um, major population, so to speak, to flood into the church, before they went to welcome those 3,000 into the church, they received a blessing from the Blessed Virgin Mary on their knees. Back to Anne Catherine Emmerich. The Blessed Virgin wore on such occasions, and generally when she appeared among the apostles in her post of dignity, a large white mantle, a creamy white veil, and a scarf of sky blue material that hung from her head down both sides to the ground. It was ornamented with embroidery and was held firmly on the head by a white silken crown. Baptism at the Pool of Bethsaida had been arranged by Jesus himself for this day's feast, and the disciples had, in consequence, made all kinds of preparations at the pool, as well as in the old synagogue that they had appropriated for their own use. The walls of the synagogue were hung with tapestry, and from the building down to the pool, a covered tentway was erected. Now, again, this is private revelation, so it's not revelation like the Gospels of Revelation. It may be true and it may not be true, but this certainly suggests something very interesting, which is that the apostles had been forewarned by Jesus himself, presumably before he ascended 10 days earlier, about what was going to happen on Pentecost, about the descent of the Holy Spirit, 
about the flood of Jews and proselytes into the church on that day, and that the apostles had made preparations for that. And they had prepared the Pool of Bethsaida. They had decorated, so to speak. They had made arrangements for what was going to happen because they were told by Jesus beforehand what was going to happen and what preparations they should make. That's certainly a very interesting suggestion um, that came as news to me from reading Anne Catherine Emmerich. Anyway, continuing with the account. The apostles and disciples went in solemn procession two by two from the house of the Last Supper to the pool. The five apostles upon whom Peter had imposed hands separated, each taking one of the five entrances to the pool, and addressed the people with great enthusiasm. Peter stepped upon the teacher's chair that had been prepared for him into the third circle of the pool, counting from the outside one. This terrace was the broadest. The hearers filled all the terraces of the pool. When the apostles spoke, the multitude hearkened in amazement, for everyone listened to what sounded to him to be his own language. It was owing to this astonishment of the people that Peter lifted up his voice, as is recorded in the Acts of the Apostles. As many presented themselves for baptism, Peter, assisted by John and James the Less, solemnly blessed the water. The holy water, which they had brought in a leather bottle from the house of the Last Supper, Peter sprinkled in fine streams far over the pool. The preparations for baptism and the baptism itself occupied the entire day. The neophytes approached Peter's chair in bands and by turns, the other apostles preaching and baptizing at the entrances. The Blessed Virgin and the Holy Women were busy in the synagogue near the pool, distributing the white garments to the ones to be baptized. The sleeves of these garments were bound over the hands with black bands which were taken off after baptism and laid together in a pile. The ones to be baptized leaned upon a railing, the water was scooped up in a basin, and then with a hand poured three times over the head, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. It flowed again through a channel into the pool below. Every two baptized gave place to two new ones upon whom they laid their hands as sponsors. Those baptized here today were those that had received John's baptism only. The holy women also were baptized. The people added to the church today amounted to 3,000. That evening the apostles and disciples returned to the house of the Last Supper, where they took a repast and distributed blessed bread. Then came the evening prayer. On the following days also, preaching and baptizing, oops, excuse me, on the following days also, preaching and baptizing went on at the pool. Before the apostles and disciples went down for these duties, they received the blessing of the Virgin Mary. So again, they are being anointed for their role in baptizing the new entrants into the church by the Blessed Virgin Mary. So. Um, I have come to the end of Anne Catherine Emmerich's account of the um, first Pentecost and the 3,000 who entered the church who were baptized by the apostles at the Pool of Bethsaida on that first Pentecost. And we are, of course, celebrating Pentecost. We're celebrating the descent of the Holy Spirit. And I know I'm a few minutes early, but it's a natural break in the program. And um, we usually have a short musical break about halfway through the program. So I will go to that now. But before I do, let me remind you this is a live call-in program. And the number here is 866-333-6279 or 866-333-MARY, M-A-R-Y. And um, it's particularly graceful to call in during the musical break because then coming out of the break I'll look at the call board and if there are any callers I'll take the calls before continuing with the rest of the show. So if you wish to call in during the musical break the number is 866-333-6279. Now 
uh, what is this musical break? Well, it is the Come Creator Spirit, Come Holy Spirit, the beautiful chant, Gregorian chant from the old Catholic liturgy. It's in Latin. So for those of us, including me, whose Latin is either rusty or non-existent, let me first read the words of this beautiful, beautiful hymn in English before I play it chanted in Latin. By the way, the group that's chanting it is known as Harpa Dei, the Harp of God. Uh, that's spelled Harpa, H-A-R-P-A, Dei of God, D-E-I. And they do have a YouTube channel. So if you're enchanted by their chant, uh, no pun intended, you can uh, find them on YouTube and listen to much more of their beautiful chant. Now, the words that they're about to chant are the following. It's a prayer, so let's say it as a prayer. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Come, Creator Spirit, visit the souls of thy people. Fill with grace from on high the hearts which thou hast created. Thou, who art called the Comforter, gift of the Most High, living fountain, fire, love, and unction of souls, sevenfold in thy gifts, finger of the Father's right hand, thou promise truly by the Father, giving speech to tongues, inflame our senses with thy light, pour thy love into our hearts, strengthen our weak bodies with lasting power, drive far away the enemy, grant peace at all times, so that under thy guidance we may avoid all evil. Grant us by thee to know the Father and to know the Son, and thee, the Spirit of both, may we always believe. To God the Father be glory, to the Son who rose from the dead, and to the Comforter for all ages. Amen. Now, I see we have a caller, and I'm asking the caller to be patient, because I, having just recited the words of the hymn, would like to play the hymn, and I will go to the caller who is online now, as soon as the hymn is over, and if anyone else wishes to call, I'm sure we have the capability to um, to hold a couple of callers um, for for the show um, after this uh, after this hymn is played. So with that, let's go to the hymn. Um, easier said than done. Let's go to the hymn. Hmm. Hmm. Well, well, there are two callers on the line, so maybe I'll take the callers while <laughs> while I try to figure out what's what's wrong with the technology here. So, okay, and for uh, why don't you put on the first caller? Um, are you there? Hello. Hi. Hello. Hello. Yes. Uh, what's your name, and where are Hi, you calling everyone. from? My name's Christina. I'm calling from Central Florida, and I'm very happy to be speaking to you. I've been following you for um, three or four years, and I tune into your weekly prayer um, almost every day. And I'd just like to add that it was a very big support to me during, you know, from November to, like, January. Um, so I, I really appreciate what you do. I don't participate in the chat or anything, uh, but I've, you know, I've, I've been following you, and I love your, um, your, your sense of spirituality, um, everything. And you really um, um, created a big love and devotion within me to um, to many saints um, that I otherwise probably would never have known of. But anyway, enough babbling. My question for you is, if you know the answer to um, the whole practice or, or sacrament or the Jewish practice, I, I guess the Mosaic law of uh, the practice of, of sacrifice, of animal sacrifice, um, I guess the, the, the Passover. Um, Oops. Where, where I'm does sorry. That come Go ahead. From? Uh, the say that say, repeat your question. I'm sorry, I got um, my system got messed up for a second. That's okay. The the practice of of 
you know, sacrificing an animal. Yeah. I guess, I guess back in, in Mosaic Law. In, where did it come from? Right. Where was that practice or sacrament instituted? I guess within Mosaic Law or, or okay. where did it... Um, that's that's a good question. If you sacrifice an, if you sacrifice an animal, your, your sins will be forgiven. And then kind of um, expanding all that, then the pagan gods always wanted blood. And, you know, everyone always wanted blood. Where did that where was that instituted? Where did that practice come from? Okay, let, let me let me talk first at least about the Jewish angle before the pagan angle, because uh, the, the Jewish angle is easy to answer. It came straight from God. Um, it's described in um, painstaking detail in the Old Testament, in particular the first five books of the Old Testament, the books of Moses. Um, it's in, um, it's certain, I mean, well, anyway, it's in, it's in all of the first five books, Genesis, Exodus, um, uh, Numbers, uh, Leviticus, and Deuteronomy, a lot of details about the animal sacrifices, a lot of details about the animals to be sacrificed, the different kinds of sacrifices, how they're to be sacrificed, um, all kinds of requirements for the priesthood who do the sacrifice and so forth and so on. So it's really an instruction manual, a very detailed instruction manual about the animal sacrifices. And it comes uh, pretty much straight from God. As Catholics, as a matter of fact, we have to acknowledge that because it's Catholic dogma that the um, entire sacred scriptures, including the Old Testament, are um, divine revelation. So... Oh, oh I do. I do. I just, I guess I'm not all that familiar with... Um the New Testament, and I know it came from God, but I, it just, I mean, going back to me being a child, I always wondered, well, that doesn't seem like much of a sacrifice on your part, because it's the animal that's giving up its life and its blood, and that's <laughs> well, being sacrificed. Well, um, th this is, um, it's certainly a bigger sacrifice for the animal, but um, it, in, in those days, uh, for many people, I suspect that, um, you know, a, a sheep or a goat or um, you know, was was a substantial. Imagine you were sacrificing your car or something like that, uh, offering your car as a right. sacrifice. But in any case, um, I don't want to be answering you sideways, but I am answering you sideways because whenever God gives instructions to do something, and He just gives the instructions to do it, and He doesn't say why He's doing it that way. I'm very reluctant to put words in the mouth of God, so to speak, to presume to know why God does what he does. And so I'm, I'm scrupulously avoiding that. It's easy to say that those sacrifices are dictated in the Old Testament, um, and therefore that the, the, the requirement is coming from God. Why he asks for that, um, you'll have to ask him, so to speak, because I don't want to be responsible <laughs> for guessing, <laughs> for guessing. Um, the pagan business is, uh, I'm probably just out of my depth. I would say we know that Satan... Oh, and, and, you know, that's, that, that's okay. I don't really care very much about, okay. about the, the pagans. I mean, it's all, it's all demonic anyway, so I don't... It's I don't all really demonic. Well, let me it, just... The, the question just kind of enkindled in me a little bit more as Jesus' sacrifice how it was related, and I think you probably taught me a lot of this, how it is so much, you know, understanding the Old Testament and the Jewish practices gives so much more meaning to our Lord's sacrifice on the yeah. cross, but it was amazing. Okay. So, you know, trying to backtrack, like, well, why did God do this to begin with? Um, yeah. And I guess it's just one of those things. We don't have to know everything. Okay, we well, let me, let, me, let me pontificate anyway, if you would. Um, which is, um, I, I think that the way to look at it is we know that Satan in the business, he wants to be God, right? He wants to be worshipped as God. That's actually why he fell. That's kind of his, you know, the soul of his being is wanting to be worshipped instead of God in the place of God. So it makes sense that if God for some reason requires sacrifice, that Satan would want to receive honor in that way, imitating God. So, um, and, and the reason I'm saying this is because the danger is saying that 
basically Judaism came from paganism and Judaism is an adaptation of paganism, which you see a lot, um, not among people who really have faith, but among, you know, essentially skeptics or atheists or whatever. And I think it's the other way around. Since Judaism was God's own religion, obviously, I mean, it makes sense that Satan would be imitating God's religion. So it's not that Judaism came from paganism, it's that paganism came from Judaism, essentially. So I just wanted to get that in. But um, I hope that oh, helped. Yeah, yeah, I think I, I understood that too. Yeah. And um, I see there's a second caller. So if uh, with your forbearance, I will go to the second caller. Uh, thank you for your call uh, very much. Um, uh, do we have the second caller on the line? Yes. Okay. Hi, hi, Professor Sherman. Hi. What's your name and where are you calling from? I, uh, my name is Yvette. I'm calling from Columbus, Ohio. Okay. Did you have a question or a comment? And, uh, just a uh, compliment. I want to thank you for uh, the talks you give every day and for Radio Maria show. And well, thank I, you. I... Uh, I think they're a treasure um, for our church, and I uh, I wish there was more people like you teaching the truth. Thank you. I try. <laughs> I don't always hit the bullseye, but I try. Um, and I'll just say for the sake of the Radio Maria listeners that what this re reference is to this daily show is that I have a, a live stream that goes out over YouTube every day. So when they're talking about the daily prayer group, they're referring to the show that I do on, on my YouTube channel. Um, if anyone's interested, uh, if you go to YouTube and if you just type in my name, Shoman, S-C-H-O-E-M-A-N, you'll probably find my YouTube channel and you can find that daily show, which is usually most days it's about uh, two o'clock in the afternoon Eastern time. Um, anyway. Okay, well, thank you very much, Yvette, for, for the kind words. And um, I, go ahead. I, yeah, just a simple thank you because I really enjoy your show and I've learned so much about our church. I'm actually um, Lebanese and I'm, I'm a Maronite Catholic, but I've learned so much from you. Thank you. Well, thank Both you. Both in history and in, in religion and theology. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, well, I, I did thank manage... Thank you so much. Oh, thank you. Um, well, this has been quite a break since I gave the words to the chant, but the words haven't changed. And I think now I have successfully queued up the chant that I was going to uh, put in, in the middle of the show. Um, the title of the chant is Veni Creator Spiritus, or Come Holy Spirit. So... Um, uh, I, I'm going to I'm going to read through the words again. I guess since since uh, it's been ten minutes or so, come, Creator Spirit, visit the souls of your people. Fill with grace from on high the hearts which you have made. You who are called the Comforter, gift of the Most High, Living Fountain, Fire, Love, and Unction of Souls, sevenfold in your gifts, the finger of the Father's right hand. You, truly promised by the Father, giving speech to tongues, inflame our senses with your light, pour your love into our hearts, strengthen our weak bodies with lasting power, drive the enemy far away, grant peace at all times, so that under your guidance we may avoid all evil. Grant us by you to know the Father and the Son, and you the Spirit of both, may we always believe. To God the Father be glory, to the Son who rose from the dead, and to the Comforter for all ages. Amen. Spiritus, mentes tuorum visita, impleso per na gratia, que tu creasti pectora. Tu septi for me. 
punere dextre de tu digitus tu rite promisum patris sermone ritans cultura Wow, you can see why I didn't want to shortchange and not not play that incredibly beautiful chant. Again, that was Harpa Dei, um, H-A-R-P-A, New Word, D-E-I. And uh, they also have a channel on YouTube if you want to hear uh, more of their Gregorian chant. Now, <clears throat> um, there's only about 15 minutes left, not even that, to the show. And uh, this isn't what I was planning to do, but um, I want to read uh, uh, the chapter two from the book of Acts um, about Pentecost. Uh, and maybe I will uh, interrupt myself as I read the scriptures to point out the transformation from Judaism into the Catholic Church, because that's what this is all about. And that, that's what this show is all about, in fact, is the transformation of Judaism into the Catholic Church and Pentecost being such a pivotal, central um, event in the transformation of Judaism into the Catholic Church. And I think we all hear this uh, reading at church, not infrequently, certainly every year on Pentecost, but I want to underline the, um, the transformation of Judaism that is referred to in this reading. So with that, reading from a chapter two of the Acts of the Apostles. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all gathered together in one place, and suddenly a sound came from heaven like the rush of a mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared to them tongues as a fire, distributed and resting on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews devout men from every nation under heaven. And at this sound, the multitude came together and they were bewildered because each one heard them speaking in his own language. And they were amazed and wondered saying, are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in his own native language? Um, Parthians and Medes and Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabians, we hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. And all were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others, mocking, said they are filled with new wine. So let me just comment on this a moment. First of all, the reason why they were staying in Jerusalem, devout men from every nation under heaven, was because it was the feast 
of Shavuos. It was a feast that Jews were supposed to um, come to the temple in Jerusalem for, wherever they lived. So that's why there were Jews from all over the world gathered in Jerusalem. They weren't gathered for Pentecost, so to speak, and they weren't gathered because they were members of the church or followers of Jesus. They were gathered because they were observant Jews from all over, gathered for the Jewish feast of Shavuos. Um, now, as I said at the beginning of the show, that Jewish feast of Shavuos was the anniversary of God giving the law to Moses on top of Mount Sinai. So what better day for God to give the new law written on man's hearts on the top of Mount Zion <laughs> to the church than that very same feast day, that very same festival. And that's why the Jews were gathered there. Now it also says both Jews and proselytes. What was a proselyte? That was a non-Jew who believed in the God of Judaism, who believed in uh, Judaism, but who was not formally um, who had not formally entered into Judaism sacramentally. And why was that? It's because circumcision was a requirement to convert to Judaism. And that was, a, of course, a very serious and unpleasant uh, hurdle for an adult pagan male to go through. So it was very typical when um, pagans converted, so to speak, to Judaism, that they didn't go all the way and be circumcised, but they simply became a follower of Judaism, but not sacramentally a Jew. Now, remember what happened on this Pentecost, this first Pentecost, is 3,000 were baptized into the church. So think how, how happy they were to find out that all they had to do was have water poured over their head um, to enter the fulfilled Judaism, let's say, the Catholic Church, rather than go through the rather um, uh, barbaric uh, rite of circumcision. Um, so, so anyway, I actually, I, I don't mean that humorously. I mean that seriously. That here you see, here you see this contrast. You have Judaism with the law written on tablets of stone, an entry requiring this. A tremendous uh, hurdle to be crossed versus the Catholic Church where the law is written on your hearts through the gentle and loving Holy Spirit not chiseled hard into tablets of stone and where entry is as simple as having water poured over you with the right words said rather than this um, extremely sacrificial and painful uh, ritual Anyway, continuing. But Peter, uh, standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice and addressed them, quote, Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give ear to my words. For these men are not drunk, as you suppose, since it is only the third hour of the day. But this is what was spoken of by the prophet Joel. Quote, now note that here Peter is quoting from the Old Testament. He's quoting from the prophet Joel. Because, of course, the Old Testament is, is saturated with prophecies of the coming of the Messiah and what will happen when the Messiah comes. And this is exactly what happened on that first Pentecost, the birth of the church, was the fulfillment of what would happen when the Messiah came. So he's quoting a prophecy, St. Peter is quoting a prophecy from the Old Testament that describes the birth of the church. He's quoting it as the church is being born. Quote, And in the last days it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams, yea, and on my men servants and my maid servants in those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in the heaven above and signs on the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the day of the Lord comes, the great and manifest day. 
and it shall be that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Okay, so this is this is all okay. <laughs> it's really wonderful to be a Jew in the Catholic Church because everything makes so much sense. In the Old Testament, God did not speak to ordinary people. He only spoke to the uh, prophets and the priests. A prophet was a very special, anointed, rare occurrence. Here, St. Peter is saying, look, in the, the Joel, the prophet Joel said that in the latter days, I will pour the spirit of prophecy on your sons and your daughters, men servants and maid servants. What are men servants and maid servants? They're the lowest class, right? They're servants. They're people who serve other people. I will pour out my spirit on the high and on the lowly. It won't be reserved for the prophets. It won't be reserved for the kings. But everyone who calls on my name will be saved, that young men will have visions, old men will dream dreams. I will show wonders in the heaven above and signs on the earth below to everybody. You don't have to be anybody special. Okay? And this is exact this is what St. Peter is preaching, and it's being contrasted with the how restricted God's spirit was in the Old Testament. I'll, I'll continue. I only have a minute or two left. Uh, continuing with the words of St. Peter, Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus, as Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs, which God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know. This Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. But God raised him up, having loosed the pangs of death, because it was not possible for him to be held by it. For God, for David says concerning him, and then he goes on. Um, so I will just point out one thing, and then I have to go, because we're at the end of our time here. But note that what St. Peter says here, this Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. Jesus' crucifixion was not a, oh my, you know, this is terrible that this happened. This is a violation of God's plan. No. Jesus' crucifixion, of course, was according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. Nonetheless, he was crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. I don't have time to go into this, but this is this is like really important to understand uh, if you're thinking about the guilt of the Jews who call for Jesus' death, that the fact that something is divine providence, God uses lawless men, I guess is the best way to put it. God uses sinful men committing sin to fulfill his plan. That's a hard pill to swallow. We tend to think that either something is God's plan and it doesn't involve sin or it involves sin and it's out of God's plan. No, God never wants sin. Never, God is never behind the sin being committed in the sense of inspiring the sin. But God has perfect foreknowledge. St. Peter says this, delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. God has foreknowledge of how free human beings will use their freedom, including foreknowledge of their intention to sin, and he weaves divine providence out of that foreknowledge. So, anyway, <laughs> just scratch the surface of Pentecost, but I want to wish you all a very happy and holy and Holy Spirit-filled Pentecost Sunday, and I hope and pray that you have the ability to uh, go to Mass in person. Uh, now that things are loosened up and receive um, the Eucharist, that would be wonderful. And in any case, certainly receive the Holy Ghost and be recharged with the Holy Spirit for yet another year. With that, it's time to say goodbye. You've been listening to Jesus, the Promised Messiah of Judaism on Radio Maria with me, your host, Roy Shoman. 
And um, I hope you join us again next week, same time, same place. And I will go out with the um, with that chant again of "Come, Holy Spirit." Bye for now. Creator Spiritus, mentes tuorum visita, impleso per na gratia, que tu creasti pectora. See.